Let me just talk a little bit about what's happening in Congress, or maybe more accurately, what's not happening in Congress. Um, let me talk about a couple issues that might come up just to kind of proactively address some stuff, but I won't do it too long because I just want to really hear your questions and address that. But um, thanks to Indivisible for putting this on. We really appreciate it. We try to do this in fall, uh, but because, uh, as you know, this session, Congress has been a little more broken than usual. Um, we had four weeks between August and Christmas that I should have been home that I didn't get home because we were still trying to elect a speaker and get a budget done. And after 19 votes, we did finally get a speaker, but that's not the normal process. Um, so we couldn't do it last fall, but we're glad this worked out. And I uh, spent the day in Reedsburg. We stopped uh, at the high school, talked to the AP students, and they had great questions, had a really nice conversation. Stopped at a business in North Freedom, talked to them about some issues that they're dealing with with the federal government, and just kind of getting around um, Sauk County a little bit today. So it's great to be with you all. So um, where are we at in uh, Congress right now? Um, we're finally getting the budget bills from last year done, maybe. Um, so our fiscal year ends September 30th. The bills that should have been done by last September 30th, we couldn't get done because the new Republican majority in the House passed bills that weren't even close to real. I mean, you know, 41 percent cut to the Department of Agriculture was not even close to ever going to happen, but that's what we spent time doing, and we had a lot of days of that. I think one day there were a hundred and some amendments to an appropriations bill, of which I think 50 of them were to reduce someone's salary down to a dollar that they didn't like. And then we never could pass the bill on the floor because they still couldn't get the votes to do that. So we did the hundred plus amendments, but you know. So it's been a, a long year, a long session. Uh, we've never worked harder to do so little. Um, before than what the session has been. But those bills were supposed to be done September 30th. We passed what's called a continuing resolution, which just means you basically continue funding things at the same level. Um, but you know, you don't increase, you don't decrease bad things, you don't increase good things, you just kind of do the same old, same old. We did that till the end of the year, then we punted again till I think January, or no, we punted till January, then we punted to March. Last week we passed five of the bills, um, and next week we're supposed to pass, or else we'll have a government shutdown again, seven of the bills, or else there may be another continuing resolution. Long story short is um, it's been pretty dysfunctional, and the president just gave us the new budget for the new year, and we're still finishing last year's. So um, I guess the good news is uh, because of some of the dysfunction within the Republican majority in Congress, um, they, even though they voted originally last year and the rule changes they made that they couldn't come and get Democratic votes for anything, the only way you could come to the floor is if they had Republican votes. But because they don't have Republican votes and we can't do anything otherwise, they have opened up some of these to a process where um, they need our votes, which means we're able to fix some of those bills. And so uh, we did, like on the five that we passed, they're much better than they were. The next seven is a little trickier because Homeland Security is in there. That's always controversial. Uh, labor, human services, education, for some folks on the Republican side, that's controversial. And so we'll see what happens next week. But that's one big thing that we're in the middle of and, and um, hopefully we'll get done or at least a continuing resolution for a little more time if that's what they need. Uh, second, um, we've got some big international stuff to deal with. Obviously, we still haven't funded Ukraine. There's proposals to fund Israel. There's humanitarian funding for the planet that's in limbo with both of those um, uh, efforts. And um, there was border funding in there, but the Republicans punted on that as well um, because there was a bipartisan bill coming out of the Senate. but. President, former President Trump didn't like it, and now that stopped any action on that. So there's a possibility we'll get to funding uh, for Ukraine, but the path is not exactly clear at this point. There's a couple different competing discharge petitions. Uh, what that means is since the Republicans can't put anything on the floor because of the rules they passed, that if you get 218 people to sign a, a discharge petition, that bill comes up for a vote. But there's a whole lot of complexity to that too, but I'm glad to talk deeper into any of the elements of this, but we're in the middle of that. And um, I guess the last thing I kind of started referring to a little bit was the border funding. I mean, clearly 
there's some problems at the border. There have been for decades. Congress has not done its job. We have not done the legislative changes that need to happen. There are some things you can do um, as president, but honestly, uh, he can't move money, for example. That's something Congress, only Congress can do, and we can't pass bills, so we can't move money. We can't pass the money through that. Part of the problem is um, the way it works right now, the, most of the paths to come here are somewhat broken. The path that seems to be the only legally clear path still is asylum, but the problem is then that's the only path. So everyone claims asylum when they come here. Some are very, very valid claims. Um, some are not. They're more economic based. The problem is the president has asked for and the Republican majority in the House has denied funding for more people at the border, specifically judges and people to actually hear the cases of someone. I mean, you should be able to turn that around in three, two or three months at best, someone who's coming, coming and claiming asylum. Right now, the waiting time in order to have your case heard is six to eight years. I know, that makes no sense, but they won't give us funding for something. So, Honestly, there's a whole lot we could talk more about, but it is an issue that when I first got to Congress in 2013, there was a bipartisan bill out of the Senate that got 69 votes, which, you know, how often you hear, first of all, something coming out of the Senate, second, something getting bipartisan 69 votes, um, and the House never took it up. At that time, John Boehner was Speaker. That would have had extra protections at the borders, would have had a pathway to citizenship for aspiring Americans, would have done much of the foundational stuff we needed to do. And that's when I got there in 2013, my very first year, and we're still waiting for Congress to do something. So I just thought I'd bring that up proactively because that, what's happening internationally, where we're at on the budget, seem to be some of the topics that come up the most. Um, thanks to Indivisible sponsoring this, I can also talk campaigns a little bit if you want to. I don't usually uh, in a town hall because they're usually on the official side. This is um, not because it's sponsored by Indivisible. So if you want to talk politics, you want to talk policy, um, you want to talk about people's anniversaries, I mean, anything else you want to talk about, it's all good, fair game. Uh, so I think I'm going to leave my opening remarks to that if that's all right. And let's just open it up um, for conversation. So uh, if you got a question, just raise your hand like this gentleman and ask away. Would you mind, sir, if I make a statement plus uh, a question? I actually prefer if we could just do questions, and I'll be glad to take your because statement. Because the statement is tied into the question. Yeah, it looks like it's really long. How long is that going to be? I can make it fast. All right. Um, we got a pretty good room. I'll start off. Yeah, I don't know if you can even skip a paragraph or two. Okay. I'd appreciate that. A couple of years ago, my wife Sandy and I lost our only son, Joshua. Josh was 29 when he died of fentanyl poisoning. Just to take it in there, well, I'll skip that. Um, after I went through weeks of grief, I researched fentanyl and discovered many things, including the fact that a lot of illegal fentanyl that was coming across the U.S. border. Um, because you represent, you're my representative for the second congressional district, I looked up what your position is on illegal fentanyl coming across the U.S. border. I really didn't find anything. What I did find was a lot of Trump bashing regarding the border. So I decided to contact your office. I never got an answer. I sent emails, I never got an answer. Finally, just last uh, January, some, someone at the Madison office answered, explained her the reason for my call, and I hadn't received a response from you. She said, oh, I see you did receive a response. I said, I did. Or I said, I did? Uh, yes, she says, it was just sent this morning. I could feel her smirk come across the phone. What I got was a form letter from you to say, just congratulating me for contacting you. So I sent you a response email, expressing my displeasure. My question to you is, why do you respond, why do you not respond in a timely manner to your constituents' concerns? Did you just run for election to represent your own cause? If that's the case, why are you running again? I call it taxation and self-representation. Gotcha. No, thank you. First of all, sorry to hear about your son. Um, let me address fentanyl for a second, and then let me address the rest, if that's all right. Um, we did put funding um, into where the fentanyl is coming through, which is the ports and the, the entry points, not just across the border, just so you know. Um, and that did happen under Joe Biden's presidency. So uh, for all the rhetoric that Donald Trump gives around the border, most of the action has not happened um, during him. In fact, the first two years when Donald Trump was president had a Republican House majority and a Republican Senate majority, nothing. 
was done at the border. So I just want to let you know, because a lot of people, uh, when it comes to fentanyl, there are specific places it come, comes through, and Joe Biden actually has proposed even more to happen there. But that is the place that we really have to be most active, and um, I've supported all the funding that we've had to do that. I serve on the Appropriations Committee, so I even deal with that even a little more directly. Um, we do get two to 3,000 contacts a week in the office, just so you know. We do try to do our best. Has anyone contacted our office uh, before? And did you get a response? Keep your hand up if you did. Yes. Uh, no back there, yes, mostly yeah. yes, okay. Well, All right. In a form letter, just like this gentleman says, it says thank you for your uh, letter, your concern. Okay. If you want to get a play, here's how you get a play. Okay, yeah. and what was, the, what was the subject you wrote on? Okay, so a frequent flyer, we call them. That's all right. Um, so we try to respond, but as I just said, I have between both offices to deal with all Social Security casework, all IRS casework, passports have been really busy since COVID and other stuff, uh, as well as all the policy work that we do in Washington. Um, we have about 15 staff and we get two to 3,000 contacts a week and we do respond to everyone. Now, sometimes when people respond every 48 hours or every week, sometimes we do consolidate those just because a letter to each and every person sometimes is difficult. But I think you can see we do respond to folks and I could show you the office budget where we have to put all the mail out or if we send it as an email, we try to. So I'm sorry if you didn't get a response. Sometimes people also, if it comes via email, because we often do that, um, it does wind up in people's junk boxes and that could be something, I'm not saying it is in this situation because I don't know enough about it. Um, but we have one of the most active districts in the country um, as far as people reaching out. It's a very, very politically active district. And you know, like I said, it, every week I get an update of what people reach out to us by volumes, uh, via calls, via emails, and via letters. And like I said, it's about two to 3,000 contacts per week. So, um, but if you want, check with us and we can you know check with Dane over there and he can try to make sure that you know if a contact didn't go out we'll try to get you something and if it did we'll make sure that you get what did go out okay, all you. right thank you no, thanks for coming too yes I have a quick question about that because yeah it calls I quite often will call 10 or 12 senators or congressmen at a time and uh, I often wonder does the message get to you <laughs> Um, I usually get aggregate numbers. So the way it works is weekly, I get a report out of everyone who's, of the issue areas people have called. I don't, I don't get a you know, call John Smith said, you know, but I get um, phone calls broken out, emails broken out, letters. Phone calls, and again, if, you, if people don't live in the district, and you probably find that when you call some of the other offices, that doesn't get recorded, right? Because we have two to 3,000 people just in district that reach out to us every single week. Um, but I get the major, the top five usually of each uh, campaign that's coming through. Um, and then if there's certain things we're tracking. Like right now, um, I got today's report alone just to show you when it comes to the discharge petition. Uh, we're trying to decide, and I, I feel like it's a tough decision. I wholeheartedly support funding for Ukraine. I have strong reservations on the current form of funding for Israel um, because I think Benjamin Netanyahu has not used the money well and I think um, we need to have conditions on funding. And so we're tracking it and I think it was 34 to 26 if I remember right between calls and emails today. So we're trying to, tr so that's how we track it that way. And the same thing by letters because usually they're unique letters. Um, postcards I think we keep track of but Honestly, for those of you who do postcard campaigns, we know how much effort went into it. That's kind of how we look at it. it. It's not as unique, so that doesn't always work. And sometimes email campaigns are like that. So I'll get 189 people on this, and it was generated by this organization. So, because sometimes we like to know just someone individually cared enough organically. I'll tell you, the number one issue we've had this year organically, people reaching out to us, the Postal Service. People are having so many problems. We've had people in Madison five days haven't gotten their mail. And so we had written a letter to Postmaster DeJoy uh, to ask for answers. He gave us non-answers back. We've asked for um, an appropriations. My, one of my subcommittees has oversight over the Postal Service. We asked the Republican chair, who's a very good person, if he would do a hearing on it. He first said, I'll tell you what, I've had a problem in my district too. Why don't you ask for a phone call with him? I'll bet you he'll come to your district. So we asked for a phone call with the Postmaster and less than two hours later they rejected it, which 
never happens that fast. So he has no intention. So I gave that to the Republican chair, who's like, this is unacceptable. Let me work on it. We're going to figure it out. But that's our number one organic for the year has been the Postal Service. We're having so many problems uh, right now. But that's kind of how we keep track of it. I usually don't get daily updates. The only reason I'm getting daily updates on this is it's a, we just, it was introduced on Tuesday, the discharge petition. And I'm trying to get a good solid read because if we're going to sign it, it's going to be pretty soon. But at the same time, I'm talking to the White House, including, well, once today, um, specifically about my concern about um, having no conditions on funding, I think is a bad idea. And I, I'd like to see what we might be able to do and encouraging them to try to do something. The president said a uh, red line about if you go militarily into Rafa, and that should mean something. And I'm hoping that they'll put something behind it. So, great. Other questions? How can you just yeah. stay? I'll tell you, I, I don't know. Um, it's the Postal Board of Governors that has oversight. We do not, and the President does not. The President does, however, appoint the people on the Postal Board of Governors. He just appointed someone who I have a lot of respect for, Marty Walsh, who used to be the Secretary of Labor. Um, so that's, I think, good, because he you know, knows federal agencies, knows stuff. But there needs to be one more appointment to technically give a Biden majority on the Board of uh, Postal Board of Governors to perhaps get rid of him. The problem is all of our mail that used to go down to Madison to get processed and if it was like going to your neighbor, now it has to go all the way to Milwaukee because he shut down everything. He tore the equipment apart in Madison and got rid of it. And um, so that's how we're getting it now. So it's just taking, and, but we're, our real problem is we have like addresses five days. And then the other thing we've heard is there's a plan, and I'm forgetting the name of it, where they're going to start delivering packages, but they might bundle your mail every two or three days. Mm -hmm. This is not what we've come to accept. And I, I personally think, because he, where he comes from is from very much a privatized approach towards this, that he would like to bring the service down to the level that um, we then don't you know, account for it. But in my rural communities, when I went to Plain, Wisconsin, the first time we went and Main Street at all the businesses, we asked what they need. The two things they said was a postal service and internet. Uh, without that, you can't be in business in a lot of areas. And you know, we know how important it is, so we're going to keep up the pressure. So you're saying you need to get one more governor in there to get rid of him? I think so. Can't I mean, you send somebody in with a box and say, when he's out to lunch, and when he gets back in, say, get your stuff, in, get your stuff is in there to eat, and put someone else in? That might be a strategy. <laughs> but it's, a, it's definitely a problem. But it is just, it's interesting, because how we do keep track of all the contacts. That one, organically. Because I always tell people, a well-written, individualized letter on a subject gets more attention in the office when they look at it than definitely 150 postcards on an issue. Because we know often people just sign their name to it and that's it. But when you actually put the thought and the time into it, and, and honestly, a personalized email is the same thing these days. Because our mail still is held back since before I was in Congress for they have to scan for you know chemicals and stuff. So um, we get mail still a little bit late so it, email is a better way often to get a hold of us so yes when we give money to countries like ukraine yeah. israel and now haiti i just said we're going to give haiti 100 million dollars how do we keep track of this money to make sure it's being used properly for what it's for yeah. and not get into the hands of the wrong people yeah you talk about hundreds of millions of dollars that that's our tax money right that's yeah. our country's money that's yeah. our deficit growing and who's, who's watching that to make sure it's being used properly? Yeah, I mean, the funds are audited. However, I will tell you, and I agree with you in one area in particular I think you should have concern, is Department of Defense. Dollars that go through the Department of Defense, um, they do not get audited like other agencies. And the, six, the last six audits they've had, they've failed. The last audit, they could only account for 35% of the equipment that they have. Um, and you know, that's not, if that's not acceptable in the Department of Education, it shouldn't be acceptable at the Department of, of Defense, right? And we need to have more accountability. But they do audit all that. I, I think when it comes to Ukraine, you know, much of this is around, you know, weapons that we're helping so that we don't have to send American men and women. And I do think that if you have someone like Russia who invades a sovereign nation, you know, especially as close 
as they are to our NATO allies. In fact, they almost are. You know, I, I appreciate that we're doing that support. When it comes to Israel, my, I, I support the defensive weapons in particular, the, the Iron Dome. So if a missile comes out of Gaza, which does happen from generally Islamic Jihad or Hamas, uh, usually at Tel Aviv or in that area, instead of anyone potentially getting hit, it takes it out midair. And the idea is it's a defensive weapon and no one dies. The problem often is Israel then responds with 100 missiles going back and they don't have that and, and that's a whole other issue. But that is defensive and I think that costs probably about two billion of the aid is for that that we give. But a lot of it, I think 10 billion of the package is just defense aid and that means a lot of offensive aid. And that's where the conditions come in. Technically, within the language we have, we have a right to have some conditions on it um, and accountability, but that's rarely ever enforced. So what we're trying to recommend, I'm trying to recommend, and some others, is specifically on the Israeli aid, I mean, just to use more missiles to flatten Gaza is not, I think, in the public interest of the United States, and I have a problem with that. So we're trying to see if we could have some conditions put on it so that if it truly is going after Hamas, they have a right to respond to Hamas but not to have collective punishment of 2.3 million people in Gaza, for example. So we generally know where that money is and there is accountability systems. We have less accountability when it comes to Department of Defense. And like I said, 35% of all of their equipment in the last audit, they can actually tell you where it's at. Pretty crazy, so yes. Follow up to that is the money that's been allocated for Ukraine, is that divvied out through the Department of Defense? Through different areas. It's, it's, I, I was actually on the phone today with Samantha Power from USAID, and for example, some of the money that's in that package is going to other, like more humanitarian type assistance or rebuilding. So it's a little bit of a variety, but it, it is, you, you can look at the bill and see where it's all. I don't have it on top of my head to tell you which department's doing each part, but you, there is accountability at least through what area it's going to. Yeah. So, yes? So What's the point of these audits if they're not actually? I, trust me. I, I, so there's a bipartisan effort, which I'm part of, is to have a real audit for the Pentagon. I mean, I think they should have to pass a real audit. And when I've talked to Department of Defense officials, they tell me right away, we don't have the right um, like accounting uh, infrastructure to do this. Well, every other agency does, right? So and if all the money we put almost one trillion dollars annually into the Department of Defense, we should at least spend some of that money for an accounting system. I could give them QuickBooks website or something, but it's, a, it's possible, right? And um, I just think a lot of it is they don't feel they need to. Um, there are certain agencies, I feel, that sometimes think that they're above the accountability. I, Department of Defense, FDA, a few others I've seen, I, I think sometimes I have some problems with how they actually respond to us. So, but it is, that's what I've been told by people who I think really know they just don't have the infrastructure. That's not an excuse. That means they should build that infrastructure to do it right. So. Well, yes. Great. So we have three branches of government. You're supposed to be a little bit separate. Um, so what, I feel like the Supreme Court has made huge overreaches into the legislative, they're, they're legislating from the bench. What kind of accountability, what, what, is there a solution to that at the moment? I, I think it's harder to address that than there is I would like to see us address there's almost no ethics laws that are currently followed by the Supreme Court. And that would be good to put in place, right? We have to follow them. Um, everyone else, the executive branch has to follow them. Supreme Court doesn't follow, they don't really have a, they, have, they don't even have guidelines really, it's very, very loose. It's hard, I mean, if they're looking at something, if they're saying the statute isn't clear, they can do that. You might say that's overreach, and in some cases I would say that's overreach as well, but that's when we then have to clarify. So, for example, Roe versus Wade is a classic example um, where uh, it's now state by state. Wisconsin now is at 1849 law in this area, but we have had legislation to um, codify what Roe versus Wade was, and that's what we need to do when the Supreme Court does that. That means the makeup of a House or Senate matters to do that, but that's the clarification that's needed at that point. So, um, but I, I think it's a, 
pretty fair nonpartisan statement to say at least you should have ethics guidelines for the Supreme Court as a co-equal branch. More ethics guidelines at the county level than the Supreme Court seems to follow at this point. Oh, absolutely. In the state legislature, when I was in the state legislature, you can't even take a cup of coffee from a lobbyist. Um, in Wisconsin, I mean, we have some of the best ethics law. We actually probably are the best ethics law in the country, and yet, you know, they're. It's been very, very loose, as you've seen many articles. Yes. Set ethics for the Supreme Court. How could you make that enforceable? Because without that, they're sort of not useful. Well, they, we could do legislation, but better yet, they could self-police with some actual. Um, guidelines in place and they have talked about it but I think there's also legislation moving towards that or I shouldn't say moving because nothing's moving um, there's legislation introduced towards that um, but they aren't being very ethical policing themselves now what they well that's because they don't have any kind of a guideline well, it's, I it's think know what's right or wrong. beyond ridiculous yeah. Yeah, right now what they have and again coming from Wisconsin where you know, when I was in the legislature, I remember that ethics reform in Texas occurred. State of Texas used to have it from in the state legislative level that you could take a trip from a lobbyist. You'd go to Vegas, literally just give you a plane ticket and say, have a good time. That was allowable under Texas law, one of the most lax in the country. Under ethics reform, you now had to travel with the lobbyist. Oh so the lobbyist would bring 20 members of the the legislature. So by Wisconsin standards, we were very strict. Like I said, not even a cup of coffee you can't take. That was, you know, how we've always uh, lived by. Uh, I'm not saying you got to be to that level because in Congress, I think it's up to $50 or something like that, I think is how it works. So you can do like a meal or something with um, a, like a group. But they, they don't have a guideline right now that really they're following anything official and that's part of the problem. When they should be accused, they aren't. There's nobody to say, hey, you have to because the ethics code is this. I don't know. Yeah, I'm with it. Wait, that's, that's a part of the issue. Yeah. Can Congress do anything? We can. No, and there's legislation. I, I'm not sure if it's introduced yet, or I know they've talked about doing legislation to do this. Again, this Congress, we passed 27 bills last year, which is, I think, the fewest since the Depression um, got done. I mean, we're. You know, we've never worked so hard to do so little. We're there a lot. We did 19 votes for speaker. I think we set a record there. I don't think we ever had 19 votes for speaker in a year. Um, well, fortunately, they're self, actually, they're self dealing with themselves. Ken Buck um, just announced he's leaving next Friday, or the, next Friday, right? Yeah, next Friday. Um, you know, they, they're, I think, at a two seat majority right now with where they're at, given the, who's left and stuff. Um, it's really dysfunctional. The real dysfunction though occurred when Kevin McCarthy wanted to become speaker. He, all he cared about, he, he's never been known for, you know, Paul Ryan you knew wanted lower taxes, right? Everyone usually, you kind of know where they stand on some issues. Kevin McCarthy never stood for anything, which is why he had some of the problems. He didn't have a, a posse behind him, you know, to help him get across the finish line but he just wanted to be speaker. So he literally gave away the store, changed all the rules, and then put some of the more extreme members on committees where usually you don't. Like on appropriations, I've been spoiled. Um, throughout the entire tri presidency, we got our work done, we put our heads down, we're not a committee that gets on camera. We don't, you know, there's committees that you go on only to spit on your colleagues. Like it's really, and that's, I don't wanna do that, you know, three weeks of the month fly across the country just to do that. So on appropriations, um, we got stuff done, uh, no matter what. We got our bills done, not always on time, but we worked in a bipartisan way and got that done. When McCarthy became speaker, not only did he change the rules where you can't come and get Democratic votes and any one person can throw the speaker out and all the stuff that makes it inoperable, um, but he also put some of the more extreme folks onto the Appropriations Committee. And so this year we did that. We didn't. We had riders on abortion, we had riders on diversity, equity, and inclusion, on pride flags, on you know, everything that had nothing to do with appropriating funds, and that broke the whole process. So then we had to extend it several times, and we're now almost halfway through the bills that were due September 30th. So um, let me go, how about here, someone who hasn't asked, and I'll come back here and here. Yes. Yeah, what about the farm bill um, and SNAP? Yeah. How is that set fair? Yeah, so um, that's another thing that Congress couldn't do. So the Farm Bill, um, 
generally is less partisan. Um, it is a unique makeup, as you mentioned. So part of the Farm Bill is agricultural funded. Part of it is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, food assistance. Um, and it's kind of been married like that to help it always pass, because you don't want people in urban districts to not care about agriculture. You don't want people in more rural districts to not care about maybe poverty in urban areas. And so this is for way before I got to Congress, this has been the Farm Bill. Um, it was supposed to be done by September 30th of last year. Uh, we couldn't, so we punted till I think the end of the year on that. It still wasn't gonna happen. The problem is if it didn't happen by the end of last year, there's a little provision in there that takes milk pricing back to 1940 something law which goes by how far you are from certain points in the country. And Wisconsin, milk prices would have gone like way up. Farmers would have been devastated, it would have been awful. So we were monitoring that very closely. Fortunately, they, at the end of the year, extended that. Now we're until September 30th to do the Farm Bill. And again, that means flat funding, just continuing the way it is. Um, there, there's a lot of controversy over the amount on SNAP. I find that to be a pretty ridiculous controversy in that my first year in Congress, um, I did a SNAP challenge uh, where I lived for a week on SNAP. So at that time, the weekly benefit on SNAP was equivalent to $31.50 a week to eat on. So I ate on it for a week, and I like food. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was tough. You know, I bought a bag of oranges, and that was like six bucks. And then you know, I got my ramen noodles and everything else. And, my office thought I was cranky, and um, but you know, at least I tried to see what that would actually turn out to be like. For a while, it went down in in real dollars, not adjusted. It was down to like 28. Then COVID helped bring it up with some ad additional assistance because more people are out of work. And right now, it's probably closer to 40 dollars um, a week, give or take, uh, per person. But that's not exactly like an amount people are, are frauding on, right? And it's something that largely is the best program to keep kids um, out of, uh, you know, hunger. So uh, I don't know if it'll get done by now. The one positive sign is the one of the five bills we did in appropriations last week was the agricultural appropriations bill. I think we cut things more like 5%, not the 41% that was proposed last year or that actually passed the House. That should set it up easier to do the farm bill because you've already appropriated some of this, but I w refuse to bet anything on this Congress at this point. So, um, but we, are, we do watch it very closely and Hakeem Jeffries, our leader, put me as one of two Midwest representatives on this special task force on it. We did a bunch of work last year and then when they threw it away, we had did our work product, but you know, we're not there. So um, if it's all right, can I go to new folks? I promise I'll come back to people um, a little bit, but I just wanna make sure that those who haven't, but I do recognize you both, okay, if that's all right. Um, so you and you, please. So uh, I'm in a group and we're counting on uh, grants from the Inflation Reduction Act to finance solar panels. Okay, schools. yep. Um, so I'm wondering, if and we're probably not going to handle it this year, or one part one this year, part two next year. But I'm wondering if money that is already, I'm not sure the right word, but I use the word appropriated, uh, is subsequently uh, potentially on the block for next year. Um, it's safe now. If a different president comes in and there's a different, or, or it, we could change it with the next budget, but I don't think we will given the makeup and what we're going through right now. If there's a different president, absolutely, the additional years out, funding could go away. You don't wanna to wait too long um, on it. Uh, I would, if you have projects and you can move them forward, you should. That's just, yeah. Also, there's a site, and I don't mean to be rude by pulling my phone out, but I have it in here and I'm forgetting the name of it, that for individuals out of the Inflation Reduction Act, if you want to be able to take advantage of portions of that, there's a site that if I don't get it, I'm gonna have Dane look it up, but I think I have it open still on here. Um, here it is. It is rewiringamerica.org rewiringamerica.org, and what it does, you can see if you qualify for any of the tax credits that are out there, you know, geothermal, electric panel, electric vehicle, um, heat pump, uh, rooftop solar, weatherization, and it's all on here, and it'll tell you 
if you're eligible. So since you mentioned that, I just want to, I know you didn't ask about this, but um, it's worth looking at, rewiringamerica.org. Yes. Oh, I just had a question. Um, I know that you've done a lot, and I wrote this out ahead of time, so I wouldn't be so nervous, but I said, um, I know that you've done a lot to champion equal treatment and inclusivity for the transgender community. I have liberal friends and I have conservative friends. Uh, I just try to be a friend to everybody, but um, they both have voiced concerns about the future of women's um, sports and the effects um, that the LGBTQIA plus community is having on girls and their ability to get scholarships and such. So what do you have to say to those people that have that perspective and what do you propose to do about it? Yeah, so right now this is largely uh, within the White House rulemaking process and really Department of Education since a White House. Department of Education rulemaking process. It's Title IX is the official terminology to it. And there's two components to it. You're gonna try me on my memory on this, but one part, both parts have had an open comment period which has now been closed. Um, but they've been talking about it for, they had it open for months. Um, one part of it, I think they're gonna be proposing something or they just did in March. The other part was supposed to, I think is gonna be delayed. So, and at that point, then once the rule is put out, people can take a look at it and I believe that's when either they can go into implementation or Congress can uh, address whatever they say they're gonna do with it. But Again, legislatively, we don't do much in Congress this session. Um, that is where the action is happening. There's a two part to it, and I'm forgetting which, part, you know, with the names of the two parts, but it's a Title IX rules through the Department of Education, um, and there's a rulemaking process. So if you Google that, at least you can kind of maybe get the most up to date timeline. I should Google Title IX. Title IX uh, rulemaking. Okay. Um, and maybe even put in March, because I think the original deadline for both was March, but I have talked to the White House as of last week. One of them I think is still on time, one part of it. Okay. One part of it isn't, and I, but I haven't seen what they you know, have had. They just had their open comment period prior to that. So, hope that helps. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. How about, go ahead, you can go, sir. Me? Yeah. There you go. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, it seems like, you know, we kind of laugh about the um, federal government not being able to do anything and it's just something that we as citizens are forced to accept. And from my perspective, I'm just getting kind of tired of it. So what can be done for Republicans and Democrats to realize that they've been sent to Washington to work for the people instead of working for their parties. Yeah, I'll tell you, the biggest thing tying our hands is, and Kevin McCarthy's not even in Congress, he ditched out at the end of the year, was the rule changes he made. I mean, one of the rule changes literally was as stupid as, you can't get Democratic votes for something on the floor, you have to only have a Republican majority, 218 Republicans, or else it can't go to the floor. How undemocratic with a small d is that, right? But that's the rule they're now living by. And the only way they found a little way around it is we work in some weird ways where you have to pass a rule to put something on the floor so there's like a pre-vote and then there's the actual bill up. The way they can get around it, and they've just started doing this, is to put something on suspension. But that means it needs a two-thirds vote. So I've just made fun of the Senate for having these antiquated rules where you need 60 votes, which everywhere else in every city council and every legislature, it's a simple majority. Now that's the only way something can try to get on the floor in the House is through a two-thirds majority because they can't function under the rules. And now with a two-seat margin, they can't either change the rules because all you need are any two drinking buddies to say no. And that's where we're at. So that's the biggest problem that we have in the House for anything to move is they won't even put it on the floor short of a discharge petition, but that means you need to organize 218 people to sign a petition to say we have to force a vote, and that's not easy to get people necessarily to do that. But we don't understand it. I know, I know, I trust me, but I'm just telling you that's how bad it is though right now. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, I was on the county board, um, I was in the state legislature, and here um, I've never seen it ever close to this bad. Um, and 
you know, a lot of people uh, think it's odd. I'm good friends with Robin Voss, the Republican speaker. It's because I used to do business with him and I still talk to him and some people can't understand that, but that's the way things used to be done. You can disagree without being disagreeable and it's not how it works anymore. Unfortunately, it's gotten so polarized and we've seen it in Wisconsin. You used to have where 20% of the people would vote for Tommy Thompson for governor and Russ Feingold for the US Senate. And now it's probably two to four percent that do that. Um, it, it's just become very polarized and you know I personally have an opinion on this but um, I think that you know that's what we're we're living through and um, that house rules change as obscure as an internal little thing like that has made it that you know like I said 27 bills all last year could even get through the house of representatives. So. Talk about it all if he's speaker next session. If, if yeah. there's a speaker, Jeffries, will that be a good thing or what? Yeah, I mean, we'll be able to function again. Um, part of the problem is Mike Johnson is so new and didn't come from anywhere near leadership. He kind of was like a process of elimination. That's why it took so many votes. And what I've been told by Republicans from the state who I, I respect their opinion on, they said he tries to make everyone happy within their caucus. And you can't, sometimes you're the leader, you actually gotta say, no, you're gonna vote on this. We gotta do this, this is the budget. It's the one thing we have to pass. You can't just say, I'm gonna be overly pure. You gotta do something. And he hasn't done that yet. So his answer has been to allow things to go on suspension, which means they have to get a bunch of our votes, which actually takes even more power away from their caucus. I'm guessing he could never even be speaker again if they had a, a real vote that came all over. So it, it's, sloppy right now um yeah so um let me uh okay i'm gonna go back here because he hasn't asked and i'll come over here and then i haven't forgot about you all right yes so do you think the new maps in wisconsin will have an opportunity to change some of what's going on in the State legislatively, yes, but we don't have any, no one's looking at new maps for the federal. The Supreme Court decided um, there was a motion before them to do the federal maps over, but the way it was written, um, Janet Prosewitz had to recuse herself because it, you had to have been on the court prior to review your, to you know, decide to get on your decision. She wasn't here for that decision, so it didn't advance. So our federal maps are the federal maps State maps, though, could help. The biggest problem is nationally gerrymandering. I mean, 80% of congressional districts are not competitive. 80%, so 20% are. And that doesn't help at all. So fair maps, period, are good. I would argue we don't have that at the federal level. If we're such a purple state, and we are, it should look probably more like four and four, not two and six. But um, nothing's gonna be different for this fall. So. Sir? Yeah. Back when we were talking before, Sounds like the federal government is broken. Yeah. How do you fix it? it? Is. We can't. We, yeah. this, we can't survive. This country's not going to survive like right. this. Yeah. I'll tell. I'll tell Eventually, you the rest of the world can get Yeah. So I know some of you like Donald Trump. I'm going to tell you my opinion. And when Donald Trump is out of the picture, I think things have a chance to improve. Um, I have never seen anyone come in in governance and in lead really because he's not governing now in such a divisive way, and that has permeated legislatures, local government, everywhere. And, you know, he's an entertainer by, by training, right? And you do things like that. That's why the news, you know, we were, I was talking to someone earlier, it's not that the news gets stuff wrong, it's that everything they, they report on, they put on a 10 volume, right? Because that's the only way you sell detergent during eight minutes of your half hour, is you gotta make everything exciting and they don't cover two people work together and get a bill done, they only, you know, find when you fight. And that's what gets out there. And unfortunately, I feel like that leadership from him now has become the commonplace way. However, when he's gone, I don't see another person with that gravitas to continue that. Um, because I think a lot of his was Celebrity Apprentice and things like that that made him unique in where he came from. So I'm hopeful that, you know, should he not win this fall, um, that someone else maybe can take over leadership in the Republican Party and get us back to a place where you get things done even if you disagree and occasionally you compromise because that's how you get things done. But we don't, you know, I think just the, the problem is right now um, is from that tone down, everyone kind of, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene 
is an absolute embarrassment to serve in Congress. There are about a handful of people that I don't even try to get to know. I'll, I, 435 people in the House, I'll get to know 430 of them. But Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and Lauren Boebert, Chip Roy, and uh, there's another one I had earlier today. There's about five of people. They're not there to govern. They're there to get on TV and they're there to fundraise and that's why they get on TV and they're not there to pass bills. So, you know, um, but, but it is the tone from the top. So, I didn't forget about yes, you. Uh, yeah. regarding the, the justices, um, just today there was an article that um, Barrett and Sotomayor commented about the, the contentious and divisive way people are nowadays that if we don't get what we want, right away there's something wrong with the Supreme Court when they rule. And um, just an example of that is when when uh, Roberts was... Let's go grab a water while we're talking. Yeah. Here, you can have mine. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when Roberts, the first... The first, uh, um, the first one he ruled on, they, they went, the, the, the you know conservatives were just all up in the air. How could he? How could he vote against us or rule against us? And I mean, and that seems to be the way with everybody. It's like, it's like my team and your team. If your team doesn't get what they want. Then it shouldn't be us. No, you're right. It is. Wrong. It's team red and team blue yeah. is where this is all yes, at yes. right now. And. Um, but again, I truly believe when you don't have one person who operates well on that kind of divisiveness, that would help. And you know, actually, I hate to see McConnell leave in a way in the Senate because he was a very much an old school traditional Republican that you know we got things done back then. I'm not sure who will be the new Senate Republican leader, but it concerns me. You know, um, and on the House side, I don't know. I'm hoping. You know, obviously, as a Democrat, Democrats take the majority, so you know we have the gavels and they're able to pass some things. But I, I don't know if um, you know the current speaker will exist again in the future with the Republicans because you know his answer finally was at least do the suspensions, but that's not governing. I mean, we're we're operating in a very odd way right now. So, yes, all the way back. I'm Chris. I'm an AP U.S. golf student at South Korea High School, taught by Ryan Musag. Oh, very cool. um, Today we learned, uh, we were talking about the TikTok ban, so uh, a question uh, concerning my generation, because you know we love our phones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what exactly will happen if that's passed by the Senate, and what was your stance on it? Great, great question and very topical because it was just a vote this week. So I was at Reedsburg uh, High School earlier talking to AP. They don't have their class in spring. It's a fall class, but they invited folks. We had about 35 people and, and TikTok, believe it or not, came up right away. So, um, <laughs> all right. So let me tell you about the TikTok bill, where I stand. I was in a deep minority on this, but I got the feeling I'm going to be proven right on this when this is all done. A year ago, there was this great outcry. Oh my God, we got to do something about TikTok. You know, it's really dangerous. How many of you have ever been on TikTok? Just raise your hand if you have. Okay, not too many of you. All right, I'm on TikTok. All right, let me show you. Um, it's just a bunch of, of videos, right? You see a few minutes, it's got, you know, this is probably a commercial for Peacock that popped up first. Um, and like all social media, um, it follows what you watch. So I get a lot of videos with dogs eating peanut butter when someone's sleeping or jumping over a couch and breaking a table because I love dogs. Um, I like magic tricks. I get a lot of magic tricks, right? I get all this stuff. Anyway, um, a year ago they said, oh, we got to do something about it. China is involved in all this. So we were like, okay, give us a classified briefing. Tell, if there's something we need to know, tell us. And we never got the briefing. And then there was one of the most cringeworthy House hearings I have ever seen because um, yeah, I just hit the median age in Congress at 59 and a lot of my colleagues have never ever been on TikTok but had lots of opinions um, on TikTok. And just to hear them trying to explain not just TikTok but technology was really, really painful and why we, we need to have people who have expertise in this area. Long story short, the conversation went dark for 10 or 11 months. And then about two weeks ago, it came back, oh, we gotta do it, we got this bill, we gotta pass it, bipartisan about TikTok. We're gonna make them, it's not banning TikTok, right? But it's saying they gotta sell. The company that owns it is a Chinese company and they have to, we're gonna force them to sell it. So 
I said, all right, I'm going to keep open because I want a classified briefing. I talked to one of the authors extensively about it. I go, but, you know, last time there was no case made why this is happening. You know, all social media, we should, there's supposed to be a bill next week, we'll see if they put it up, that regulates all social media and our personal data. That should pass. Like right now, they sell our data, and that's why you see the kind of commercials you do, and we should have more privacy over our data, and I'm going to vote for that bill if it comes up. I'm not sure it will. They say it will, but I don't uh, trust but verify, right? But this one, they said, is just to deal with TikTok on this. So I kept the open mind, um, and I went to the classified briefing, and I won't say anything classified that was said, but honestly, there was nothing classified said that was uh, you know, compelling. In fact, just the opposite. I left there convinced to vote no on it. What this is more about is there is a lot of anti-China and you know, all this out there. And I think that's where this is coming from. It feels like you did something, but we don't really know what we're doing. But the head Democrat on the Intelligence Committee said something in the classified briefing, and I couldn't repeat it then, but luckily he said it publicly since then that I thought was the most compelling argument. He said, so let me get this right. Countries like China and Russia that we're nervous about block people's access to social media. So our response is to block uh, access to social media from companies. And, and it is like, is this really the right message to be sending? And he said, and he's right, I get more intelligence information than almost anyone in Congress. He's the ranking Democrat, former chair of the Intelligence Committee. If he didn't see it, and I didn't see it after going to the classified briefing, but he sees a whole lot more than me. There's not a great compelling argument to say that, in fact, one of the arguments, and I gotta make sure I can say this is a public domain one, but it, it even went against their argument. One of their main arguments was completely against their argument that this is gonna happen. On top of it, this was done so fast and sloppy, they said within six months of the bill passing, the company has to sell or else it's down, right? Because this is a giant company and because we have antitrust laws in the United States, for any company to buy it, that process will take more than six months. So you're guaranteeing, you just forced a company to have to sell their product, their company, not product, their company, and you gave them an unrealistic time period that it won't be able to even continue and it will go dark and you do it without a real, comp a lot of it is this could happen, this might happen, and none of it has happened. And so I voted no on it. And at minimum, I hope the Senate gets rid of that six months because that's, I think, you know, you can't do that. I mean, you can't claim you're not banning it and put them out of business that easily. But there's not a compelling argument yet there. And um, they're saying just because it's a Chinese company that China can make them give the data, but they have absolutely no records of this ever happening. And uh, so anyway, it's a long answer. We just voted on it. But it was a very, one of those where like I was willing, if there really was a national security reason, uh, you know, I would have listened to it. I, Again, when I look at my, my feed, and you know, a year ago the Wednesday dance was really popular and things like that, I'm like, I don't know if that's you know, convincing me to you know, join the CCP. But um, <laughs> no, no argument was made that convinced me there was a real risk, and I do think there's a very big brotherish, big government sort of approach to what was happening. So. You got me. I got you, okay, I'm not sure, all right. Back here again. Do you think that's a generational thing? I, you know what I Only think it is? I don't trust, and like you said, they are not aware of the technology that we have today versus... For members, in fact, I had members told, tell me, oh, this is, I also forget, failed to mention, this didn't pass my smell test at all. We have a process, right? Something goes to a committee or multiple committees of bill for review. Generally, a subcommittee on the committee, you have an expertise, so if you're education and labor committee, then there's a higher education committee, a K to 12, a pre-K, right? So you got a smaller group of members who really focus on that. This went to no subcommittee. It went right to the committee that it went to for the vote. It went to a classified briefing only for committee members immediately to a vote after. You could even go back to your office and talk to your staff about it. And I had several people told me they were gonna vote no and then the group thing came out and they all kind of voted yes on it. And I'm like, you know, if you have a credible argument, you don't have to do that. And if you're, pat and I think that Department of, of Defense, Department of, or the intelligence um, agencies, 
Uh, FDA, there's a few that in my now 12 years experience, I find would rather not have this pesky Congress get in their way. And they would love to have more tools to protect us, but this is again a might, could, should, and honestly, in a very unconvincing way. And I just think, you know, to go after, there's a slippery slope, because, you know, I think the argument was, oh, so Saudi Arabia could buy it then and run it, and that'd be okay, because the bill only said China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. So yeah, Saudi Arabia could buy it and then run it, we'd be all okay. Or China could buy the data from one of these data brokers anyway because that's completely legal, and that's what they're worried about them getting from uh, ByteDance, the company that owns TikTok. Well, we didn't address any of that. So to me, this was kind of Congress at its worst, you know, trying to rush something, not really doing it well, and um, I don't need to do groupthink. I, I, I thank all of you for being my constituents who allow me to do this, because I do this sometimes on a fairly regular basis. Sometimes I'll find something like this, I want to talk about it. Um, because it's not right, and I think you allow me to have the chance to talk about it and do those votes. And you may not always agree with me on some of that, but I appreciate you giving me that latitude because, you know, most people are afraid to call stuff like that out. And there's a lot of lobbyists. There's 15,000 lobbyists in Washington, D.C. You can imagine how many from Meta and all these other co companies that wanted to see this happen. Um, and, and that's sometimes people don't speak out for that reason, so. Yes. On the same topic, yeah. we all, probably all of us, including you, don't want, think it's right that uh, tech or social media tech can take our personal data and use it however they want. It should be regulated. ByteDance is a foreign-owned company. Would they be subject to the same rules should some rule regulations yeah. be passed that Google or Meta would be? Yeah, they would. And, th and, that was, and that's why I support that. In fact, I, I tried to tell the author of the bill if he was really you know, if you really wanted to persuade me, is do both the same day, because then I would say, at least you are trying to address the issue. Yeah. But the Republicans have promised we're gonna have it up next week. I don't bet on that, because there are so many special interests on this who don't want that. All, you know, no one, they, that's how they make all their money is selling our data. And until I see it come up for a vote, I'm not convinced it's coming up for a vote. So, you know, um, and the way you could have convinced me more is if you would have did both the same day. And they both had a unanimous vote out of committee, but we only took up the one. So, uh, okay, I'm being told how much. We have comments. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of lobbyists, is there, are there going to be details on White House Easter hunt? <laughs> 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 Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't know the story to it. <laughs> Pettit wants potatoes and all eggs. Oh, God, no, I don't know. I, I missed that. See, I, it didn't show up on TikTok. So I, did, no, I don't know. I didn't hear any of this. Sorry. I've never been to the. They're lobbying for potatoes and milk. I have never been to the Easter egg hunt because I, if I get a chance to come home on the weekend, I'm home on the weekend. Because generally our schedule, I'm home August. Uh, that's the in-district period that we're around and we try to get around. But generally, I'm out there three of the four weeks. Sometimes it's two and two, but that's rare. Usually it's around like a certain holidays. But it's three weeks I'm out there and then I'm back home. So I come home almost every single weekend. Um, so I've not had a chance to do the Easter egg hunt. I've only been to three museums in Washington in almost 12 years. I know. I'm, so one of these days. If they were only open at like 9.30 or 10 at night, I could go. But they don't keep it open for us. So yes. I have one last question. Yeah. Uh, how long do you think our government and the country can survive accumulating the debt that we are as fast as we are? You, you know, this is one area I think Joe Biden has been especially good on and not gotten a lot of credit because, you know, even when Donald Trump did his tax cut that where, you know, 85 or 83% of the money went to the top 1%, that added... I think it was $7 trillion to the, the national debt. Um, Joe Biden came and did a few things that were not, didn't get as much attention as I thought. Corporations so often have like a shell company in Ireland or somewhere where there's no tax rate, and they take their sales from here, and they claim somehow they're from there, and then they don't pay any taxes on their sales here, and they have them all you know, washed through a country that doesn't have any tax rate. And he said, no, you know what? There's gonna be a minimum 15% 
tax for all corporations. And he used that to fund a big part of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and helping fund the solar and all the rest of the stuff. That's how he did it. And he did some other innovative things where he kind of went, if you bring back some of the revenue that we used to have, you can absolutely address that in many ways. And um, part of our problem is a, a tax cut is, is also called tax expenditure. It's no different than spending money on education or you choose to spend it on a tax cut. It's an expenditure. And if you look at it that way, suddenly there are more opportunities. And we're not talking taxes on the average person, but you know, rich people pay way less than they used to. I mean, look at what they did under Eisenhower, right? 90% tax rate on the highest uh, volumes. Um, look at corporations what they used to pay and at least you know Joe Biden's done some things including that minimum tax and now I think he's proposing going to 21 percent um, trying to raise it a little more because it's the right thing to do they shouldn't be allowed it doesn't matter if you are on team red or team blue right if a company is intentionally finding a shell uh, a company to put up in Ireland to not pay taxes on things sold in the United States that's not red white or blue right and we need to go after that and I think you know, he's done that well and um, I don't think he got very much credit for it and he should have. Yes? Why doesn't he get credit? What is the problem with Democrats not being able to message when these kind of things happen I'll tell you, on their yeah, side? I, they, I'll they tell you, make it clear. we did so much the first two years of the Biden administration that what they didn't do is take time to take holy pictures they just got more stuff done so we were coming out of COVID we passed the American Rescue Plan. Ask anyone in local government or state government how much that helped save us and get us out of that. That also you know, did a number of other things coming out of COVID. Then we passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Four presidents, Democratic and Republican, talked about infrastructure and no one did anything except for Joe Biden. He passed a bill that's investing in roads and bridges, broadband, $1 billion coming to Wisconsin alone on broadband expansion, which where my phone just wasn't working so well in North Freedom, um, certainly will be helpful as you know, things like that you know, get expanded. Um, then he did a Chips and Science Act, probably one of the more geeky things, but it's making things back in America again. We don't make a lot of computer chips. We found during COVID the reason car prices went up so much was because we make, I think it was 12% of the computer chips we use in this country, we make in this country. So he passed a bill. To, among other things are computer chips, so that's one of the major parts. Just by passing that, $40 billion was leveraged, not government money, private sector money to build the factories to help employ people to make stuff here. And that was that bill. And then we did the Inflation Reduction Act, which in addition to um, lowering costs on energy and healthcare, I mean, it did things that almost are unheard of in, in Medicare. Yeah. No more than $2,000 out of pocket if you're on Medicare for prescription drugs. Negotiating for drug prices. Of that 15,000 lobbyists in Washington, 1,500, 10% are big pharma. He stood up to big pharma and were negotiating for prescription drug prices. He wanted to lower the price of insulin for everyone, and Republicans didn't agree, but we did it for people on Medicare to $35. 100 years ago, the first patent came out for insulin, and the, the industry has gamed it for a hundred years to keep it under some sort of patent. And Joe Biden figured out a way to get around it. So the problem is he was busy doing stuff, and we didn't take the break to say thank you, thank you very much, thank you. And I know, trust me. And part of it is people like me is my job. So when we have a chance to talk, I say like that's just four bills that we passed that are pretty much going to affect every single person in the country. Maybe chips and science a little less in Wisconsin because we don't have one of the companies making it here. We almost did. The Foxconn facility, the <laughs> giant empty building that Scott Walker gave us, um, it was down to a call center or making computer chips. Like a really, really good jobs or okay jobs. And the okay jobs unfortunately won out. So. Medicare, which we get yes. into and deserve when we retire. Absolutely. And I'll tell you one other issue I'm working on, and I'm just going to put out there, I'm going a little long, but that's all right, if, if it's all right with our sponsors. So, and this isn't a values thing. So, if I say this and you don't want to raise your hand, you don't have to. How many of you are on Medicare Advantage versus, okay, and how many of you are on Medicare? 
All right. So we're working a lot on this issue because um, I've become a little obsessed on this. Um, my mom uh, passed away a couple years ago at 93, but in her late 80s, she got on one of these Medicare Advantage programs. Medicare Advantage is a private health insurance alternative to Medicare that very, very smart and wealthy lobbyists uh, came up with at a certain time when this was passed into law. And um, what it does, it's what was designed, how can we help reduce the cost of Medicare? And they thought, this, they, they convinced everyone this is the way to go. Also, they're able to give you something maybe you don't get with Medicare. So a dental, vision, a prescription drug, a hearing, additional benefit, a gym membership, something. And if you're younger and healthier and you're not traveling, it might be good for some people. It, it, it might be all right, but you have to be in network to do it. Unlike Medicare, where if you need something, you just go to the doctor and you get taken care of. You got to use their network, all right, but if you travel, that comes out of pocket if it's not network. But here's the big issue with it. They deny a lot of claims. So you have to get prior authorization. So if you need something and you're on Medicare, you go and get taken care of because Medicare will pay for it. On Medicare Advantage, millions of claims are denied a year, and this is the real kicker. 85% of them, when appealed, are overturned. These companies are just denying, but denied care often at that point of your life, it, it means you die, right? And this is what they're doing. On top of it, every single company has criminally been charged for overbilling the federal government, and it's to the tune of $140 billion in the last year we kept track of. That would pay for Medigap insurance for every single person on Medicare. So this has gotten a really sweet ride for a while because it's twice as profitable as regular health insurance for insurance companies. So some of us have now got a group of members and there's a group of nonprofit uh, organizations and we're working together. We just had a meeting that I had put together with the Secretary uh, of Health and Human Services, Secretary Becerra, to talk about this. We're trying to have them change a lot of the policies, but you know, I introduced a bill that makes total common sense to me. It's not gonna pass this Congress, because guess what, nothing passes this Congress, but it's to not let them use Medicare in their name because they're Medicare Advantage programs. I have no problem with a private insurance alternative. You want Blue Cross Blue Shield Advantage, you have a right to do that. It's a private insurance program. But we don't let you call yourself the United States Postal Service and Package Delivery, right? You can't use the federal government agency name and anything else, but those lobbyists were really, really smart, and I'm guessing really rich right now, <laughs> who came up with the plan to say Medicare Advantage. And I just wanna warn people, you know, it, it, if you're younger and healthier and you don't travel a lot and you have a good network and you might be fine, but I had some people reach out. It's one of the things we hear a lot about in the office. They're in their 60s, signed up for Medicare Advantage. In their 80s, they now need some health care, and it's being denied. Not now get authorization, and you, it's hard to switch back then to Medicare. Um, and it's again how the system was designed. So this is something that someone needs to go in there and start untying the knots, and we're trying to work on that. And thank you for the extra five minutes to to go onto my rant. But it's a subject that you know I think we got to talk about. There is something else that I heard in speaking yeah. with people that work in insurance. Mm -hmm. Because I've heard a lot of bad things about it. And uh, they said, don't go into it. They said, insurance builds Medicare first for themselves and then Medicare underneath them. And I think that's where the problem is, is why they're not paying as much because it's all in one the insurance company and Medicare. And Medicare is only going to pay 80%. Yeah, oh no, there's a whole bunch, so like this year, just, I mean, again, I'm obsessed on this subject, but um, we're cutting the money that goes to um, OBGYNs 3% through Medicare. At the same time, they're prior announcing what the increase will be for Medicare Advantage, they're proposing 3.7% increase for them. So the caregivers are getting significant cuts, and the insurance company is going to get 3.7%. So. Anyway, sorry, lecture over, but I, um, it's something I'm putting a lot of time into and we're trying to get some stuff done on. And I just, again, if it works for you, fine. Just be really, really cautious. My mom, when she was in her 80s, uh, lived in assisted living. I didn't finish that part of the story and needed some care. 
a doctor came to the assisted living facility, if you were on Medicare, she could have, because she couldn't really wasn't very mobile, could have had care right there. But because she was on Medicare Advantage, she couldn't do that. She would have had to go all the way across town and couldn't physically do that and never got the care she needed. And that's just the story that we hear from a lot of constituents. But I saw it when my mom said, hey, look, I got a prescription drug, ben drug benefit. And what she didn't know is in Wisconsin, we already have senior care. We have a great prescription drug benefit that helps seniors. So she probably would have got more from that anyway. And, you know, uh, just one of those issues. Well, let me wrap then in saying thank you um, for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, you know, we got a chance to talk about some things you're interested in. If not, um, you know, catch me and we'll you know, talk about whatever else you want to. Uh, the last thing I want to make a plug for our office in Madison. Um, in Madison, we do most of our casework, which is helping you when you have a problem with um, your veterans benefits, the IRS, getting a passport, um, you know, anything that happens to the federal agency. DC is more of the policy work that we do, but please, you know, uh, reach out if we can be helpful. We kind of have uh, the bat phone for an antiquated reference, you know, to some of these agencies we can kind of cut through. And we have success stories every week I hear about from my office that where we've been able to help someone, sometimes waiting years to get through on a benefit. But if we can help prod, I mean, this is 335 million people in the country, it's hard to navigate, but if we can do it, um, or Senator Baldwin or Senator Johnson, you should reach out to our offices and let us do that, because um, that's one of the things that actually we can do when a Congress isn't working, and uh, you know we love to be able to do. So keep that in mind for your friends and family. So, all right, and thanks again for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to hear about your son. Yeah.